Well, I actually want to talk both about Timor a bit and also about Indonesia. And uh, uh, I want to actually consider uh, two cases of uh, mass murder, one the one of which you've just seen a small sample in the slideshow, uh, and another one which preceded it uh, by about a decade, namely the, uh, the elimination of the uh, PKI, the Communist Party of Indonesia, in 1965, uh, which perhaps led to uh, the massacre within a few months of on the order of half a million people. Uh, these two examples are uh, two of the major uh, examples of mass murder in the latter half of the 20th century, and they uh, would stand re relatively high in the competition at almost any period. Uh, they are particularly important for us, and you know, I'll repeat what I've said in other talks on other topics around here, uh, because for two reasons. For one thing, because uh, uh, they shed a good deal of light on uh, what the United States is up to in world affairs, uh, and related to that, uh, we can do, we well, you know, we we still can do a lot about them, precisely because the American responsibility is very high. In the case of East Timor, it's virtually an American supervised massacre. Uh, it is possible, to, and the United States has, as has been indicated, has been in the forefront of efforts to uh, block any uh, resolution of the conflict which would permit self-determination or perhaps even survival for the Timorese. Uh, because of that, it is entirely possible for us to do quite a bit to change the situation and to save thousands of people. We'll come back to this. Uh, but this is the criterion that, at least for me, makes an issue important. Uh, and that's why this issue is important. I think it's also the reason why uh, very few people have heard about East Timor. Uh, by exactly the same criterion, namely, we're responsible and we can do something about it, it's extremely important for the propaganda system to suppress knowledge of it. So correspondingly, nobody hears about it. Uh, and in fact, it's kind of interesting to compare. Uh, there's almost a history was kind enough to set up a controlled experiment in this case, virtually. Uh, it's uh, it, it, during the late 1970s, there were two major massacres carried out in uh, Southeast Asia, one in Cambodia, the other in East Timor. They're comparable, relative, they're about, probably comparable in scale. If you'd like some details on that, I'll talk about it later. But they're roughly comparable in scale. Uh, it's not quite accurate to say that they're comparable in character because the East Timor massacre was carried out in the course of aggression, which ever since Nuremberg has been regarded as the highest of the most severe of war crimes, whereas the Khmer Rouge massacre was internal. Uh, uh, th there is one other fundamental difference between them, namely in the case of the Khmer Rouge, it was possible by cutting some corners here and there to attribute the uh, deaths and killings entirely to an official enemy, whereas in the case of East Timor, uh, it was only possible to attribute the massacre to the United States. Uh, and that corresponds with another fact, namely that there was massive coverage in the press and great wailing and the bemoaning of the inhumanity, of, uh, et cetera, on the part of the Khmer Rouge, but nothing or else lies uh, uh, concerning uh, East Timor. That incident is a very revealing one, if you think it through. It tells you a lot about the ideological system and about the country and about the, uh, the, the way in which uh, indoctrination is carried out. Uh, and uh, uh, also, uh, 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 it's one. Uh, uh, this is a particularly clear example because the two cases are so close in area and character and so on, uh, differing just in the properties that I mentioned. But there are many others like them. Well, in the case of any example of mass murder, uh, the question that arises and is very hard to answer is how people are capable of doing it and how they're capable of tolerating it. Uh, and uh, uh, there is also a, a harder aspect to this question, and hence one which is usually shunted aside, and that is how we ourselves are capable of carrying out or tolerating or regarding as legitimate uh, uh, mass murder and uh, virtual genocide. So we tend to shy away from that question, not surprisingly. Uh, both of these questions arise in a very sharp form in the case of the two massacres that I want to talk about. Uh, in the case of the... Uh, uh, in the case of the 1965 massacre, I'll give a little bit of the background, uh, the, uh, the United States probably had some role in implementing it through uh, connections with the Indonesian military. But more important than striking is the way in which the massacre was uh, greeted in the United States. 
when the massacre took place, it led to almost to near euphoria in, in the United States. I'll give some examples later. Uh, and uh, in fact, it was regarded as, uh, in particular among liberal Americans, as uh, it was regarded as legitimizing another simultaneous massacre that the United States was then carrying out on the uh, mainland of Southeast Asia, uh, namely the, uh, in Indochina. I'll come back to some quotes, but this conjunction is quite interesting. If you look back at the uh, statements by quite liberal and later anti-war, people who regard themselves as anti-war uh, 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 academics and journalists and others in the United States, you find that the, the fact that uh, half a million people, mostly landless peasants, were killed off in Indonesia in the late 1960s was explicitly put forth as a justification, as legitimizing and as justifying the American war in Indochina, which provided a shield behind which these magnificent developments could take place. You find this in, say, advertisements by Freedom House signed by distinguished American scholars and so on uh, in the, the press and so on and so forth. That's a quite a remarkable incident uh, and deserves to be better, better known. Uh, in the case of East Timor, the story is a little bit different, uh, whereas one can argue about the extent of U.S. complicity in the uh, actual massacre in, in Indonesia. Incidentally, the best work I know about this is by Peter Dale Scott, who's here uh, in a very important article on the background and the American involvement in the Indonesian coup. Typically, there's very little material about this. It's very hard to find out anything about it. It's not the kind of topic that is uh, convenient to study or you know leads to great plaudits in the press and so on. And as a result, there's very little work. Uh, but Peter's is a very good article that I urge that you read in a book called uh, Ten Years of Military Terror in Indonesia, edited by Malcolm Caldwell. It's prob I don't know if you've got it around here. It was very hard to get, but it's an important book and one of the few. Uh, however, uh, in the case of East Timor, the problem is there's no, is there's no issue about the American involvement. In fact, the American responsibility is direct and overwhelming. If there's some time, I'll come back to details. But it was perhaps evident enough from these few comments that were made in the, with relevance to this uh, slideshow. Uh, how about the way in which it was received in the United States? Well, this is a little bit different than the 1965 massacre. As I said, in the case of, in the 1965 massacre, this was uh, greeted with enormous enthusiasm and applause in the United States uh, because the class enemy was liquidated, and that's always legitimate. Uh, but uh, uh, in the case of East Timor, the reaction was a little bit different. Uh, the uh, uh, the, the um, uh, reaction was uh, suppression, primarily. And this took several forms. Uh, first, for several years, there was simply denial of the facts. So the press either didn't report the facts or else reported State Department lies, uh, or else you had you know, the incredible spectacle of the Pulitzer Prize winning Southeast Asia correspondent of the New York Times, Henry Kahn, who in the occasional uh, uh, moments when he deigned to discuss this trivial event uh, would go to the Indonesian uh, uh, Information Ministry and report their version of what was going on there as fact. So it turned out, as in, in the so-called news columns of the New York Times, uh, you read the statement as fact that Fretel and the guerrillas had forced the population into the mountainside, but now they were fleeing from Fretel and control to areas where they could be protected by the Indonesians. These facts were not based on, say, interviews with refugees, plenty of refugees, but the New York Times wouldn't interview them. In fact, over four years went by before they agreed to talk to a refugee. In striking contrast to Cambodia, where the same person was, say, interviewing refugees held under police custody in police in Thai prisons and reporting what they said as fact, kind of, you know. Uh, but here, you don't talk to refugees. You talk to the information ministry of the uh, Indonesia. And on his authority, you explain uh, that the cruel Fretilin guerrillas are forcing the population, you know, et cetera, and the Indonesians are saving them and rescuing them. That's fact. Uh, well, that's what went on for four years. Uh, Finally, the facts became very difficult to uh, dismiss. The way that worked out is of some interest. At this time, I'll talk about it. But after about approximately four years of suppression, uh, the press changed and began to cover the facts. In fact, there was a few good reports. Uh, but after that, a new phase entered, which I wouldn't su suggest that the facts are now being reported. They're not. The past facts. You know, what happened five years ago is being reported. And perhaps 
five years from now, some crusading journalist will uh, will write a you know an article which, which will win a prize about the massacres that are being carried out right now. For example, the uh, invasion that was just mentioned last uh, last fall. You know, I'd say maybe about five years. It's fair to wait before that news hits the press. Uh, and uh, uh, when after the the news was. Uh, after it became impossible to completely suppress the facts, in part because of Congress, in part because of a couple of young activists who were really working on this very effectively, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the line changed, and a, a new form of uh, deceit, if you like, took over, and that's what you find in the press commentary on this now. So, for example, when the New York Times now describes uh, 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 what happened in East Timor, they will have it under, say, editorials, with a headline such as The Shaming of Indonesia, or a very good article by Henry Kahn about, uh, uh, about what had happened and about the massacre and starvation and so on, is called The Silent Suffering of East Timor. Uh, or when, say, a presidential, uh, an assistant to uh, a speechwriter for President Carter, James Fallows, another sort of guy who identifies himself as a peace movement spokesman, when he concedes that something unpleasant happened there, uh, he says, yeah, it was bad. He says, the United States averted its eyes from East Timor. Well, uh, and that's typical. Now, the facts are a little bit different. It was not the shaming of Indonesia. It was the shaming of the United States. But if somebody tries to write a letter to the New York Times stating that fact, as I have, it won't get published. Uh, and uh, as far as the silent suffering of East Timor is concerned, uh, Henry Kahn might have improved his article if he'd explained to us why it was that the suffering of the East Timor, Timorese was silent. Was it because, for example, they didn't try to get their story out? Or was it because the distinguished Southeast Asia head of the New York Times Bureau was too busy talking to uh, uh, Indonesian generals uh, and refusing to talk to, Indone to East Timorese refugees? Is that perhaps the reason why their suffering was silent? Well, again, that might have been worth a word of comment uh, in, the, in, the, in the New York Times, but you didn't find it. Uh, and as far as the United States averting its eyes from East Timor under the Carter administration, that's not precisely the story. What happened is that uh, the uh, Indonesian invasion by 1977 had reached such a point of severity that Indonesian military stocks had been depleted. Uh, as was mentioned, they were using 90 percent, uh, they were 90 percent supplied with American arms, and arms continued to flow uh, to, to Indonesia uh, from the moment of the invasion, uh, incidentally, contrary to lies that the government uh, produced before Congress in congressional hearings. The government claimed in congressional hearings that there had been a six-month arms ban after the invasion uh, to, as a signal to Indonesia that we were against it. Well, there was a six-month arms ban, perhaps, uh, but it was, didn't appear in the American press. It was kept quiet, and in fact, it was kept so quiet that the Indonesians never heard about it. They were quite unaware of the arms ban, as it turned out. And furthermore, during the period of the arms ban, as Ben Anderson, who's the Indonesia specialist at Cornell and virtually the only professional who's in the United States who's played an honest role on this topic, as he pointed out in congressional hearing, he discovered that uh, during the period of the arms ban, uh, uh, first of all, the flow of arms never stopped because the pipeline kept going. But furthermore, the United States, during the period of the arms ban, uh, actually initiated you know, new offers, including parts for OV-10 Broncos, these counterinsurgency helicopters, uh, during the period of the alleged arms ban. These were new offers presented to the Indonesians by the United States during the period of the arms ban. Well, that was that. But anyway, by, by 1977, uh, Indonesian military stocks had been uh, pretty much exhausted. Uh, and... Uh, at that, since fortunately we had a human rights administration then, uh, so the human rights administration, uh, well, which was supposedly averting its eyes from East Timor, increased the flow of arms by about a factor of 10 uh, to enable the Indonesians to carry out the genocidal attack that was then underway, uh, leading to the result that you saw in those pictures of these uh, children when they finally, you know, sort of deigned to uh, concede what was going on. Uh, well, averting one's eyes is not exactly an accurate description of that, and the description is particularly disgraceful when it comes from a minor flunky of the Carter administration, who's meanwhile sort of explaining to us what a great uh, pacifist he is, James Fallows in this case. Well, uh, uh, these are all facts, but of course not facts that you can talk about in polite company. These are just the domain of what are called extremists in the press. Uh, uh, but I urge that you become extremists in this sense and uh, learn a little bit about it. Well, let me give 
briefly the bare facts of these two examples of near genocide, but again, I want to focus attention on our responsibility, which is easy, you know, for which we should no longer avert our eyes uh, for, for these actions. Uh, in the, what was the background for the 1965 massacre? Well, briefly, there was a, uh, at the time, President um, uh, Sukarno, the president of Indonesia, sort of an old nationalist figure, was cr trying to sort of hold some kind of a balance uh, in a very complex situation, which involved really a conflict between uh, the PKI, the Communist Party, is sort of a mass-based popular communist organization based largely on peasantry and plantation workers and others, uh, and which was, you know, it, it looked as though they were going to, if, if electoral, if, if uh, anything like, uh, you know, electoral politics or whatever were going to persist, they were probably going to take over. That was on the one hand, and on the other side was the army, uh, which was trained and uh, with, with, which had very close connections with, with American military. The United States was uh, trying to maintain, although Sukarno was rather uh, anti-American at that stage, uh, the United States was continuing to supply the army, uh, and in fact uh, that uh, was held in later congressional testimony. For example, uh, Secretary McNamara was asked, Secretary of Defense McNamara was asked whether he thought it was worthwhile to have continued military aid to this country, which was very hostile to the United States. And he said, yes, he thought it was very, uh, very helpful. In fact, he said there had been enormous dividends from that military aid. Yes, that's true. There were dividends, uh, 500,000 corpses among them. Uh, and uh, that's the, uh, uh, that's a typical and not unusual pattern. It was replayed later in Chile, almost in exactly the same way, and one finds the same thing elsewhere. Uh, so American military aid may be quite, uh, you know, may look inconsistent with the attitude of a country toward the United States sometimes, specifically in cases like this, when the United States is trying to uh, keep its connections with uh, military forces, which will uh, then overthrow the regime and uh, institute, uh, you know, bring about the sort of freedom and democracy in the manner in which they did in Indonesia. We'll come back to that at this time. Again, uh, Peter Scott's uh, uh, study goes into this in considerable detail. Well, on the 30th of September, uh, 1965, there was uh, an event of disputed character, uh, uh, perhaps a coup attempt on the part of uh, perhaps a pre -pre 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 preemptive coup attempt, uh, in which uh, uh, in which the uh, the relation of, of the Communist Party to this is unclear. Uh, but uh, what one consequence was that uh, it was junior officers who. Uh, who uh, carried out, let's say, a coup. And in the course of that, six Indonesian generals were killed. Uh, that led to the retaliation, uh, which uh, involved the, the massacre that I've mentioned, the massacre, of the, uh, of the massacre which essentially eliminated the mass base, much of the mass base of the, uh, of the Communist Party, and put the army strictly in command. It resolved this conflict that I've mentioned by uh, putting the army in command short, shortly thereafter, Sukarno was basically dismissed. Uh, and since then, it's been, a, in effect, a military dictatorship uh, with the, the, the major political opposition, the former Communist Party, now demoralized and disbanded and so on. The victims of the massacre were largely landless peasants, uh, Javanese plantation workers, and their fa the families of people connected with the party. Uh, whole villages were destroyed in many areas. Uh, some ethnic Chinese, Chinese merchants got caught up uh, in the uh, massacre, you know, people were settling scores and so on. Uh, the actual numbers one really doesn't know, but uh, usual estimates are in the neighborhood of about half a million. Uh, about by the maybe three quarters of a million people were taken, were made prisoners, and many of them were kept in uh, prison camps under quite atrocious conditions. There's a lot of Amnesty International material on this for a long, long period. In fact, they were just released uh, very recently, uh, where there was torture and uh, executions and the usual stuff. Uh, well, the, this massacre continued sporadically till about 1969, but, but mainly it took place within a few months, in the last few months of 1965. Uh, one major consequence of this was that uh, the Indonesia uh, became, was sort of thrown open to foreign investment and it became, as a number of European correspondents have described it, uh, just became a paradise for investors. Uh, anybody want this thing up for some reason? I don't know. 
Okay. <laughs> it, uh, it was uh, virtually all barriers to Western, primarily American and Japanese investment were, uh, were taken down. And uh, in fact, uh, the country was sort of open to Western plunder, uh, not entirely because the uh, plunder was impeded to some extent by the incredible rapacity and corruption of the Indonesian generals, uh, which has led to complaints repeatedly in the Wall Street Journal and elsewhere. But apart from that impediment, uh, you, you were sort of free to rob at will. Uh, uh, that the uh, Indonesian generals themselves became a kind of a comprador of bourgeoisie, if you like, sort of the local associates of foreign multinationals, pretty much, and enriched themselves enormously. Most of the population uh, for most of it's again hard to get data, but uh, it appears that for most of the population, uh, the economic miracle was the usual disaster with uh, actual living standards either remaining the same or even declining, uh, uh, much uh, suffering and starvation among the mass of the population in a potentially rich country, uh, which has certainly enriched others, uh, uh, Japanese and American investors, for example, and Indonesian generals. Well, that was the major consequence of the coup. Now to the U.S. reaction. Uh, there was no, apparently no congressional reaction at all that anyone's been able to find. Joel Rockamore is one person up here at Berkeley is one person who's worked on this. As far as the press was concerned, there was a reaction. Uh, for example, James Reston of the New York Times uh, had the following reaction in, the, in an article entitled A Gleam of Light in Asia. Uh, he, this is after the massacre, uh, after the, the massacre had been publicized of, of these half million mostly landless peasants. Gleam of light in Asia. Washington is careful not to claim any credit for this change in the sixth most populous and one of the richest nations of the world, but this does not mean that Washington had nothing to do with it. There was a great deal more contact between the anti-communist forces in that country and at least one very high official in Washington before and during the Indonesian massacre than is generally realized. General Suharto's forces, at times, he, he's the general who sort of took over and conducted the massacre. General Suharto's forces, at times severely short of food and munitions, have been getting aid from here through various third countries, and it is doubtful if the coup would ever have been attempted without the American show of strength in Vietnam or been sustained without the clandestine aid it has received directly from here. So that's the background for this gleam of light in Southeast Asia, uh, which uh, led to... Uh, namely this, this lovely massacre that I described. Time magazine chimed in a couple of weeks later with an article uh, in which they stated, entitled The West's Best News for Years in Asia. Uh, Max Frankel of the New York Times had an article a little earlier in which he now editor described uh, the exuberant responses of Washington officials who were, in his words, elated to find their expectations being realized. Uh, U.S. News and World Report had one which said, hope where once there was none, namely after the massacre. Uh, coming up to more recent times, uh, this continues pretty much, uh, we have people like, say, George MacArthur, the veteran correspondent of the Los Angeles Times, Asian correspondent, who had the following to say. He says, in 1965, the Mao-inspired Communist Party, now outlawed, attempted to seize power and subjected the country to a bloodbath. That's very nice. I like that. You know, they subjected the country to a bloodbath by allowing themselves to be massacred by the U.S.-backed generals. So that's what the comment is. Uh, and then we have uh, Maxwell Taylor, uh, who was, you know, the sort of gray eminence of the Kennedy administration and a sort of a big thinker who's had a big effect ever since. Uh, he wrote around 1972 that Indonesia's independence today and its relative freedom from an internal communist threat is attributable to a large degree to what we've accomplished in South Vietnam. With US forces moving into Vietnam, the Indonesian anti-communists were willing to run the risk of eliminating President Sukarno and destroying the Indonesian communists. Now that's a standard line. Uh, the, our actions in South Vietnam, our attack on South Vietnam, I mean, that's not his word, of course, our defense of South Vietnam to revert to the standard sort of Stalinist style rhetoric used by propagandists. Uh, the, uh, our defense of South Vietnam provided a shield behind which the Indonesian generals were encouraged and able to take this courageous act of presiding over the massacre of some half million landless peasants. And therefore, it was very good. That shows that our invasion was good. Freedom House had an advertisement in the New York Times in November 1966 signed by 154 people who they described as distinguished Americans, academics, political figures, and so on, uh, saying that the United States 
intervention in Vietnam was justified because it, quote, provided a shield for the sharp reversal of Indonesia's swift shift towards con uh, communism. So that made it good. Freedom House statement signed by moderate, so-called moderate scholars shortly after, again justifying the uh, U.S. war in uh, Vietnam, uh, referred obliquely to what they called the dramatic changes in Indonesia, which were the result of our courageous actions in South Vietnam. Uh, the most dramatic change, which they were too delicate to describe, being this uh, bloody massacre, which I just mentioned. Uh, Peter Hastings, the editor of the Sydney Morning Herald, Australia, had an article in the New York Times a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, in which he said the following. He said, the 1965 coup changed Australian perceptions of Indonesia overnight. Indonesia's huge Communist Party was liquidated. The emphasis at home was on economic rationalism. Abroad, it was on friendship with the West and regional cooperation. This led many Australians to believe that a special relationship was possible between the two nations after all. In other words, up until that time, when Indonesia was following a policy of sort of third world independent nationalism, uh, Australians were looking quite askance at this unpleasant development. But then when these dramatic changes took place in late 1965, you know, this lovely, delightful, bloody massacre, Australian perceptions changed overnight. Uh, and uh, they thought that maybe a new relationship was actually possible by, you know, the Western humanists are now able to come to terms with these third world outlaws. Uh, and that's, that's very typical. You know, it goes on and on like this. This all passes without any comment, you know, no comment at all. Nobody ever sees anything funny about it or strange about it. Uh, it's simply taken for granted. I mean, obviously, as I say, if you liquidate the class enemy, that's to the good, and then maybe we can have some dealings with you. Uh, and our own massacres being conducted at the same time in South Vietnam and the rest of Indochina by then are justified because it provided a shield behind which uh, the Indonesian generals who we had cultivated were able to carry out this uh, delightful act of of uh, mass murder. Well, that's the reaction to the, uh, to the Indonesian coup. That's the typical reaction to it. And again, it's very revealing and illuminating. Uh, there is more background that should be given about this, because you, you shouldn't think of these events as, if you look at these events as isolated, you really don't get the picture of where they fit in the evolution and character of American foreign policy. Uh, the way I think they should be viewed is, is against a background which would, I have no time to go through it, it would include events such as the following. Uh, the United States was, uh, was in fact, uh, looking for a counterweight to mass popular movements in many parts of the world. This is really true ever since the Second World War. And it was very hard to find them. Uh, this was true in Europe and in Asia and elsewhere. There were, at, at, during the Second World War, you know, there was a big resistance, the popular resistance that developed against the fascists and in, German, in Europe, the Nazis. Uh, and uh, this popular movement, both in Asia and in the, uh, many popular movements, but in both in Asia and in Europe, had a rather different picture of the future that they intended than the one held by the conquering armies. Uh, well, the conquering armies uh, had to impose their own vision of what the picture of the future was going to be. And as I say, it was quite inconsistent often with the liberation forces themselves, the resistance forces. This is all familiar with regard to Eastern Europe. For example, we all know very well how when the Red Army moved in, it imposed uh, a brutal uh, totalitarian oppression, which was quite remote from that of much of the uh, uh, anti-Hitler uh, resistance forces. What's less familiar is that precisely the same was true in the most of the world, which we liberated. Uh, and the picture began to become clear very soon, very early. The typical picture was that the United States was, and Britain too, insofar as it was able to act, uh, was able to, were, were uh, quite, there's not, there are exceptions, but quite typically what happened was that the United States, the liberating forces, had to find some way to demoralize and undermine and uh, eliminate, disperse somehow the resistance forces and to restore in power some competing force. Well, what was the competing force? Well, very often it was, it was Nazi collaborators. Uh, sometimes, uh, for example, in Italy, it was the mafia in parts of the territory and, and Nazi collaborators. Sometimes well, there was no choice but to try to cultivate the military as an alternative force. Indonesia is a case like that. Uh, and this pattern showed itself over and over again in many parts of the world. If there were such a field as, say, political science or contemporary history and so on, it would be studying these things uh, because there is a very, it would be studying the highly systematic pattern that evolved throughout much of the world and was very significant. It's made a big, had a big stamp on future events. Just to mention a few cases, uh, in uh, 
Uh, was, the first example, I think, was probably 1942, uh, when the first liberation took place, when the United States liberated North Africa. Uh, and the head did find somebody to, you know, take control, and they naturally, Roosevelt naturally picked Admiral Darlan, who was uh, the author of Vichy's vicious anti-Semitic laws and an outright Nazi collaborator, and in fact one of the most extreme Nazis in, in the French system. That's saying a lot, because the French, by and large, were overwhelmingly collaborationist, and while various mythology has developed about French resistance, if you look, and you know, to some extent it was true, if you look, the story was quite different. But Darlan was extreme. I mean, he was, in fact, the anti-Semitic laws that he was instituting even went beyond what the Nazis wanted. So he was a natural choice to be the, uh, by Roosevelt, to be the uh, in charge of our North African liberation. The next act was in Italy. We sort of started moving up through southern Italy. Uh, and there, it was a little tricky. We were, we were relying on these uh, Italian partisans. Uh, as distinct from the French resistance, the Italian resistance movement was quite a significant business, and it was holding down many Nazi divisions, in fact, so we weren't going to undermine that uh, yet. Uh, but as the uh, uh, American army moved up from the south, when it, the first thing it did was essentially reinstate the fascist government without Mussolini. The Badoglio government, which, which was installed, was sort of the old fascist government in its constituency. Later, after the partisans had liberated much of northern Italy, they were essentially dispersed and, and removed. Uh, this is incidentally a kind of an interesting book that just came out about this by Basil Davidson, who was a British, uh, um, what they call that British special operations uh, something or other. But, yes, so he was special operations, what, D, I forget what he's, executive, yeah. He was a sort of a British agent who was working in Italy and Yugoslavia. Uh, and he's just written some reminiscences called, I think, Scenes from the Anti-Nazi War, in which he describes the liberation of North, Northern Italy by the Italian partisans, and then the American army moving in and sort of telling them to get lost. Uh, and that's essentially what happened. Uh, he incidentally had some interesting remarks about Yugoslavia, too. There the British were more involved, and for a long period, the British uh, uh, insisted on supporting the Chetniks, who they knew were collaborating with the Nazis against the Yugoslav resistance, uh, and he describes the interesting infighting going on in the Cairo office where the agents in charge of this, including him, were trying to somehow get the British government to stop supporting the Nazis through the Chetniks in their attack on the uh, partisan armies that were trying to fight the Nazis, and finally they succeeded in some complicated way. Churchill himself had to intervene directly to try to get some support to the resistance instead of to the Nazis in Yugoslavia. Uh, well, and then, you know, uh, that, so that was Italy. Uh, in Greece, I, I don't know, I talked about this a little bit yesterday, but that's one of the most interesting and least known cases. In Greece, the British conquered the country from the resistance after the Nazis had left. There were no Germans there when the British army entered. Uh, and Churchill ordered the British army basically to conquer the country from its own. He said, treat it like a conquered, like a conquered country. And they did. Uh, there was a brutal British attack uh, in which the anti-Nazi resistance was pretty much dispersed, partly through its own errors, but partly through just British terror. Uh, and then uh, an effort was made to uh, restore the anti the the sort of pro-Nazi collaborationist elements and the royalist elements uh, and to destroy and disperse the resistance, largely communist-led, though not largely communist, incidentally. Uh, and that went on for a while, but Britain couldn't carry it off. Britain didn't have the power in 1946. It was sort of on its knees, really, after the effect of the war. Uh, so the United States took over on, in 1947 uh, under the Truman Doctrine, uh, and uh, uh, we carried out a vicious extremely vicious counterinsurgency campaign, which is really a model for what later happened in Indochina and should be viewed in precisely that fashion, and is even a model for what's happening now in El Salvador, a fact which, incidentally, the administration is aware of. Roger Fontaine, who's one of the uh, uh, Reagan's uh, Central American advisors, said not long ago in an interview that he thought what we, did in, what we should do in Central America should be like what we did in Greece under the Truman Doctrine. I don't know if he knows how accurate that remark is, uh, maybe he doesn't, uh, but, if, but it is very accurate. The, what the United States is trying to do in El Salvador today is, is kind of a replay under slightly different circumstances of techniques pioneered uh, in Greece in the late 40s. There, there was, without going into details, uh, there was, you know, there was, there, again, sort of mass murder, political executions. Uh, edu we used to like education camps in those days. We had a program of re-education camps through which tens of thousands of people passed, and if they were lucky to get through without being executed, they then, you know, were indoctrinated into what we like to call democracy. Uh, the uh, 
uh, the, the, the mass base of the United States, crucially in this connection, the United States and Greece insisted on demolishing the uh, opposition. The Greeks, including the Greeks' collaborators who we were backing, wanted some sort of amnesty or settlement or something or other. The United States refused uh, and explicitly refused because it was necessary to, to eliminate the class enemy, you know, to wipe out the possible opposition so that then uh, democracy would be possible. Democracy is only possible after you've eliminated forcibly the opposition. That's the technique. Then you have elections and everybody cheers. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, this, uh, went, this happened in Greece. Uh, and just to shift to other parts of the world, in Thailand at exactly the same time, uh, well, in Thailand during the war, uh, the OSS, the sort of predecessor of the CIA, was collaborating with a free Thai movement in Thailand headed by a man named Priti Phanomyang, who was, had been really the one figure who had been involved in any democratic semi-parliamentary movement in Thailand. He was collaborating with the United States. Meanwhile, the premier of Thailand, Fibun, his name was, had declared war against the United States and was collaborating with the Japanese. Uh, two or three years later, the situation was a little bit different. Uh, we were backing Fibun, the guy who had declared war against us, uh, and the Free Thai Movement was dispersed. And shortly after, uh, this sort of liberal Democrat who had been collaborating with, the, uh, with us during the war, he was off in China. Uh, American historians who write about this, like Frank Darling, describe this as ironic wasn't ironic at all. It's very natural. And in fact, if you look at it, not in the case of that, in the context of that one incident, but the entire history, that's exactly what you find. Exactly as in Greece and elsewhere, uh, the pro-fascist elements were restored in power uh, because uh, really, they, you know, they were the only ones who would do our bidding. I and mean, who's going to do it? You know, not the resistance forces. They had their own picture of what the future was going to be like. In the Philippines, pretty much the same happened. Uh, the United States moved in. Uh, there was a uh, th there was, again, a resist an anti-Japanese resistance, quite significant, peasant-based, was wiped out over the next couple of years, and fascist collaborators were once again restored into, in power. Uh, the most extreme example of this, of course, was Indochina itself. There, the resistance forces couldn't simply be dispersed and eliminated so quickly. The French tried to reconquer the colony, weren't able to do it. Uh, the United States moved in. And the rest of the history of Indochina, briefly, is an effort by the United States to carry out what it had done uh, successfully through the intermediary of, you know, Greeks, largely pro-fascist elements, uh, to do it in Indochina, and it wasn't able to do it completely. It did it partially. Uh, it's important to remember that the main force that we were fighting, namely the National Liberation Front in South Vietnam, that was pretty well destroyed by the American attack against South Vietnam. But elsewhere in Indochina, the uh, uh, the um, United States could not completely conquer, though one shouldn't underestimate the effect of the extent of the victory. Uh, and uh, 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 so this, in this case, is known, so I won't talk about it. Well, it's in this context, really, that one should see what happened in Indonesia. Uh, in Indonesia, somewhat belatedly, it was necessary to do something about the same kind of situation. Here was a case where the the, the United States in the early stages supported the nationalist forces in Indonesia because they were regarded as what is called pro-Western, that is, they would accommodate to Western power and American investment and so on. But through the 50s, this was beginning to change, and the early 60s was quite different, and something, it was necessary to do something. Uh, so you had uh, views like, and uh, there was no, uh, the, the, the forces that could be relied on in this case, it was thought, were primarily the military, in fact, maybe only the military. So. Uh, you get comments like the following from Guy Parker of the Rand Corporation. Uh, he says, who's a specialist on Indonesia, he says, communism is bound to win in Southeast Asia unless effective countervailing power is found in some groups who have significant, sufficient organizational strength, goal direction, leadership, and discipline. Such groups are not likely to be found in the present political systems. Those best equipped are members of the National Officer Corps as individuals and the National Armies uh, as organizational structures. The officer corps seems to include some of the new country's best human material, men with above average qualities of leadership, patriotism, and commitment to moral values. The officer corps will face the choice of taking over their countries or letting the communists fill the vacuum. To succeed in the competition with communism, the officer corps will need substantial economic and technical assistance. Such aid will strengthen the determination of such regimes to oppose communism in Southeast Asia. Perhaps overnight, the general staff uh, or some younger members of the officer corps of Indonesia will strike 
sweep their house clean, and rededicate themselves to higher purposes. Uh, the Council on Foreign Relations and other organizations describe the situation in roughly the same way, and my distinguished colleague Lucian Pai, who's a specialist on Burma and Indonesia, uh, has a long, some amazing <laughs> remarks about this, which again, Peter dug up, uh, which talk about how the military leaders are often far less suspicious of the West than civilian leaders because they themselves are more emotionally secure. Since these, uh, <laughs> since these leaders seem to have less need to avoid realities, they are, in fact, easier people with whom to deal and to carry on straightforward relations. This leads to the conclusion that the military and the underdeveloped countries can make a major contribution to strengthening essentially administrative functions. This kind of stuff passes for uh, science, you know, and scholarship, I should say. These are not sort of offbeat people. These are, you know, sort of leading intellects in our, uh, you know, humanistic culture that I'm quoting here. Uh, and now this, you know, you can laugh, but this is no laughing matter to the people who are massacred by these uh, high moral leaders once they're put in power with our aid. Uh, that's the story of Latin America in the last 20 years. In 1976, the kind of quasi-official Linowitz Commission had a report in which it said that the plague of repression has settled over Latin America, which has no, no counterpart in the bloody and murderous history of that continent. Uh, yes, that was true, and it was because of things like this. It was because in 1960, around 1960, 61, the Kennedy administration shifted to internal security, uh, and under the advice of people like the ones I quoted uh, in Latin America, started to cultivate these uh, you know, emotionally secure and highly moral elements and give them the wherewithal to carry out the you know, the high technology torture and the mass destruction and the murders and so on, which have then led to this plague of repression. Well, same in Indonesia. Uh, and, uh, well, just to quote McNamara, I mentioned this, but he was asked in congressional hearings by Senator Sparkman, great liberal, uh, the following question, this is a little bit later, uh, 1966, he was asked by Senator Sparkman, at a time when Indonesia was kicking up pretty badly, when we were getting a lot of criticism for continuing military aid, at that time we could not say what that military aid was for. Is it secret anymore? Secretary McNamara, I think in retrospect the aid was well justified. Senator Sparkman, you think it paid dividends? Secretary McNamara, I do, sir. Senator Sparkman, I believe that is all, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, that is all, in fact. The aid did pay dividends, and it's no longer necessary to keep secret what it was about. Uh, Chile, as I said before, was a replay. Well, uh, that's the rough story of, of uh, Indonesia, and as I say, it's part of a pattern. It shouldn't be viewed simply in itself. It's part of a general pattern. Uh, it's part of a pattern which could fairly be described as a kind of a war that the United States has had against large parts of the population of the world uh, since 1945 for perfectly un understandable reasons, and a war which has led to mass murder and torture and repression in many, many places. We miss this when we study individual incidents. You know, you study some individual case like East Timor, you sort of miss what's going on. Uh, in two respects, for one thing, you don't see the whole pattern. And for another thing, there's, as I mentioned yesterday, for those of you who were there, we tend to get caught, I do too, we all get caught in this trap of studying what happened over there, you know, so learning all the details about East Timor. But that's, you know, no, important to know, but of infinitely less significance than knowing the facts about Washington. You know, knowing the facts about the people I've just been quoting. That's what we really ought to know about, and that's systematically excluded from study. There is no field which deals with that, uh, and nor could there be. Well, that's East Timor. Let's take a look at, uh, that's Indonesia. Let me take a look at East Timor. Uh, I think uh, we, we should understand, the question was asked before correctly, why should the United States have backed the massacre in East Timor? And the answer was given correctly, uh, because we just didn't give a damn. Uh, we did, however, care about Indonesia. I mean, in Indonesia, after all, they got all these high moral leaders. Uh, I guess I really should read one more quote that, again, Peter dug up. I can't stop this. Guy Parker, the guy I quoted before, yeah, <laughs> said in 1964, the one who was talking about, you know, how the Indonesian military should strike and sweep their house clean and so on. In 1964, he said that he was afraid that they wouldn't be able to do it. He said that he feared that the anti-communists in Indonesia, quote, would probably lack the ruthlessness that made it possible for the Nazis to suppress the Communist Party of Germany. He said they are weaker than the Nazis, not only in numbers and in mass support, but also in unity, discipline, and leadership. That was 1964, while the United States was funneling the secret aid to these highly moral individuals, etc. Then in 1968, after the massacre, Mr. Parker, uh, 
declared himself as follows. He explained that the assassination of the six army generals by the September 30th movement elicited the ruthlessness that I had not anticipated a year earlier and resulted in the death of large numbers of communist cadres. In short, uh, contrary to his earlier opinion, the, uh, you know, these, the military leadership did have the ruthlessness that made it possible for the Nazis to suppress the Communist Party, so therefore everything was good, gleam of light in Southeast Asia. Well, because of this, you know, because they exhibited this Nazi-like ruthlessness and so successfully liquidated the class enemy, preparing the way for elections and so on, uh, naturally, and of course also threw the country open to American penetration and investment, main thing, uh, because of this, Indonesia is a valued friend and ally. I mean, they sort of won their way into the free world by, you know, the proper actions. And therefore, if they decide to take over uh, a, a territory on their border and conquer it uh, in violation of international law and United Nations resolutions, well, naturally, we'll help them because they're a valued ally. And if it turns out the fighting isn't going too well and they need more helicopters to kill another 100,000 people or something, well, we'll supply them. Uh, and we can do this, of course, as long as the press is silent and as long as the scholarly profession is silent, with very few exceptions like Ben Anderson, so that people don't know about it. Because if people know about it, they're going to start screaming and stop it. So therefore, you have to prevent them from knowing about it. That's the rough story of East Timor. Well, um, uh, again, there's some you know, amazing things that ought to be mentioned about this. When, when the... the um, well, the slideshow sort of gave you the rough background. I won't go through the exact details. When, when in Indonesia invaded in December 7, 1965, 75, right after Ford and Kissinger were there, and obviously with their approval, uh, a, the United Nations did respond immediately. There was an immediate reaction at the United Nations, uh, and uh, um, uh, an effort was made by the United Nations to terminate the aggression, and they passed a pretty strong resolution uh, denouncing the Indonesian aggression in early 1975. Uh, they couldn't really put any teeth into it, and the reason was uh, U.S. obstructionism. Uh, and that's uh, proudly described in a most amazing uh, series of pages by uh, Moynihan, Daniel Moynihan, the American ambassador to the United Nations. If you look at his book, A Dangerous Place, you find a description of these events, which is quite incredible. Uh, not only that it happened, but that it passed, you know, that it's never commented on. Here's what he said. Uh, he describes U.S. Tactics. He was. You may recall Moynihan was a great hero in the United States because he was showing fantastic courage and standing up against you know tremendous opponents like Benin and the Seychelles Islands and so on, and sort of defending the United States against them. And this was considered, a, you know, a great aroused a lot of patriotic fervor among American liberals because of his courage in this. But that wasn't all that he was doing. Uh, he was also, for example, undermining UN efforts. Uh, to block the invasion of East Timor, and here's the way he describes it. He says, the United States wished things to turn out as they did and worked to bring this about. The Department of State desired that the United Nations prove utterly ineffective in whatever measures it undertook. This task was given to me, and I carried it forward with no inconsiderable success. Well, he knows, he knew at the time he was writing how things had turned out, and in fact, he explains it. Uh, he says that within three months after the Indonesian invasion, uh, he says apparently about 60,000 people were killed. Uh, actually, he puts it a little differently. Let me describe the way he puts it in con conventional terms. He says, since the Civil War of August 1975, uh, he says, since the Civil War, about 60,000 people have been killed. Well, yeah, that's right. Uh, the thing he didn't say is that the Civil War itself led to the death of maybe 1,500 people, uh, and the rest were killed after the Indonesian invasion, uh, which... Uh, he had abetted, as he says, with great pride, uh, by, at, be, be, uh, by acting in accordance with State Department or orders, uh, the State Department wishing things to turn out as they did by his measure uh, with the killing of 60,000 people in two months. Uh, he points out, incidentally, that this means that within this two-month period, uh, Indonesia had killed a proportion of the population, approximately equivalent to the proportion of the population of the Soviet Union that had been killed by the Nazis during the Second World War. He points that out uh, with no further comment, uh, and he then said, uh, so in fact, he's, he's taking credit for a comparable action uh, for uh, the massacre of 10% of the population, in this case, within two months. Uh, that's uh, Moynihan uh, uh, in, uh, in his, you know, sort of prideful account of, of this great achievement of his uh, conduct of American affairs at the United Nations. Uh, no reviewer, of course, would ever mention this, even if they would notice that there's something a little odd about this uh, self-congratulation. Well, uh, then came the what I described, the uh, 
the Indonesians, uh, they, they took the capital city, they, the population mostly fled to the mountains. Uh, for a year or so, they, well, instead of my telling you what happened, let me describe it in the words of a very good witness. Uh, in uh, January 1980, I guess, uh, a, a Portuguese priest, a 63-year-old, then 63-year-old Portuguese priest, uh, Father Leonardo do Rega, uh, who had fled with Fretilin to the mountains, uh, uh, surrendered to the Indonesians. Uh, he had uh, uh, he surrendered virtually starving. That was after the Carter administration had averted its eyes, so that you know the population was mostly starving after the military attacks. He was no longer able to stay up in the Fretilin areas, the areas where most of the population was, and he surrendered. And he was uh, put under kept by the Indonesians under uh, captivity for uh, 79. This was January 79. Uh, for some time, and then finally released, and there was a lot of publication of what he wrote in the world press, world press outside the United States. Uh, there was some effort here made to get the American press, he came to the United States trying to tell his story. He's a very credible witness, you know, conservative, 63-year-old Portuguese priest. I mean, if he had some communist atrocity stories to tell, he'd be on the front page of every newspaper and in television and so on. Uh, but and he's very, he's very, you know, soft-spoken and credible and expert. He describes what kind of planes there were and so on and so forth. Uh, well, uh, we did succeed in various ways to get an interview with him in the New York Times, uh, in which uh, he said this was now, I think, December 1979, uh, in which he said the following. I uh, quote. He said, apart from the main towns, people in the interior of East Timor weren't aware of the war. People had food commodities aplenty. It was a normal life under not normal circumstances. Problems started in early 1977. A full-scale bombardment of the whole island began. From that point, there emerged death, illness, despair. The second phase of the bombing was late 1977 to early 1979. That was the period of our averting our eyes, remember, with modern aircraft. This was the firebombing phase of the bombing. Even up to this time, people could still live. The genocide and starvation was the result of the full-scale incendiary bombing. We saw the end coming. People could not plant. I personally witnessed, while running to protected areas, going from tribe to tribe, the great massacre from bombardment and people dying from starvation. In 1979, people began surrendering because there was no other option. When people began dying, the others began to give up. And he estimates about 200,000 people killed in the regions where he was. Well, that was his report to the New York, that was his interview with the New York Times. Out of that, here's what survived in the columns of the New York Times. He said that bombardment and systematic disruption of crop croplands in 1978 were intended to starve the islanders into submission, period. That's the report of the thing that I just read, and that's all that appeared. Uh, now, uh, how did I get the thing that I just read? Well, I got it because the Boston Globe, who uh, under pressure and mine and others, decided to uh, agree to let a reporter write a story about Timor, but they didn't pick a foreign correspondent, thoughtfully, you know. They picked a local reporter, a guy who's accustomed to going over to the local police office and digging out what the crooks are up to and so on. And this guy wrote the one decent story that has ever appeared, as far as I know, by a reporter on this issue in the United States. Uh, because he dealt with it the way you would deal with a story where you don't have to cover up. He's not a professional foreign correspondent. He didn't know the rules of the game. Uh, and he, uh, he went to, uh, he actually, he managed to find someone who I can't identify who had, uh, who had the original transcript of the Times interview, and that person who was annoyed, to put it mildly, gave it to him, and he published it. Uh, and the, tr the transcript is what I read, but what appeared in the Times is just a kind of a one-sentence whitewash. This was after the Times had agreed, after many, many years of pressure, to at least publish something on the topic, so we should be grateful that at least a word came out, namely that word. Well, the transcript by Father Leonardo tells what actually happened, and I don't have to give any more details. But remember, that incendiary phase of the bombing, uh, that was carried out because the Carter administration had vastly increased the flow of arms to Indonesia in the certain knowledge that that was exactly what was going to take place. It's a real uh, fitting epitaph, if you want, for the Human Rights Administration. Uh, in the fall of 1978, the uh, Indonesian government allowed, that was Indonesia in, and the United States, that means, were refusing to permit any uh, Red Cross or other international surveillance of anything going on there, which is quite unusual, you know, that in the worst of wars, the Red Cross is always allowed in. Uh, and of course, the press wasn't saying anything. But finally, in December 1978, the Indonesians did permit 
a trip by uh, a, a kind of a carefully controlled trip by some selected correspondents and a couple of foreign ambassadors, including the American ambassador to Indonesia. And uh, a couple of reports came out. One actually was published, in the, I think, in the San Francisco Chronicle by Norman Pegum, quite a good American reporter. Uh, uh, and there were one in the Far Eastern Economic Review and so on. And they described what they described was, you know, just incredible. Uh, they described essentially what you saw in those last few pictures of the starving children. They described a situation which they said that, you know, the relief officials were with them described as worse than the Thai-Cambodia border, uh, like, uh, you know, worse than Biafra, I mean, kind of like Bangladesh and so on. That's what they found. And the ambassadors were, were appalled. Uh, however, the American ambassador, uh, Edward Masters, he claimed that they, the ambassadors hadn't seen anything, that they just everything looked fine, you know, sort of happy peasants and so on and so forth. Uh, and in fact, even internally, even on internal documents, he, he, he did finally incidentally make a request through internal channels in the State Department to, for the United States to send some aid, but that was nine months later. For nine months, Ambassador Masters, after he had seen these things, did not even make an internal request in State through internal State Department channels to uh, begin to offer some kind of aid to something comparable to, you know, the sort of Thai-Cambodian border and the Biafran famine. Why? Well, again, this was brought out by Ben Anderson in some commentary, the likes of which I have never seen in congressional hearings. I mean, you've got to read the rhetoric. It's a lot of this is quoted in my book, Towards a New Cold War, which just came out. Uh, uh, and uh, Anderson points out that the reason, the undoubted reason why Masters was keeping this quiet and lying to Congress about it in testimony was that the Indonesian generals were not yet secure um, enough to allow anybody in. Uh, but an internal State Department cables show that by the spring of 1979, the Indonesian generals felt that the situation was sufficiently under control so that they could allow the Red Cross and Catholic Relief Services, which is a very dubious agency, largely runs off American government funds, uh, they were allowed in. Uh, uh, in uh, and at that point, you know, when the Indonesian generals gave the green light, as Anderson says, then Ambassador Masters, through internal State Department channels, advocated sending some humanitarian aid, because, of course, we are a humanitarian country deeply devoted to the welfare of starving people throughout the world. But through that nine-month period, before the Indonesian generals gave the green light, and after he himself had seen, you know, uh, the kind of thing that you just saw on those last few slides, he kept it quiet uh, because, you know, we couldn't yet exhibit our humanitarian instinct. Uh, well, uh, that, uh, uh, what about the I mean, it's, uh, the, the press coverage remains, you know, it be began to pick up at that time in, in January 1980. The New York Times deigned to interview some uh, refugees uh, in Lisbon for the first time. They'd always been readily available. It's much easier to find refugees in Lisbon than refugees in Thai police cages in, in, in uh, you know, but of course they were giving the wrong stories, like the refugees in Honduras, so therefore you don't interview them. Uh, uh, but in, after four years of war, you know, not a short period. I mean, it's the same as the length of the American participation in World War II. And to keep a massacre quiet for that time, it's not a small achievement when you think about it. There's some elegance to this. But in January 1980, James Markham did uh, go, uh, New York Times correspondent in Spain, I guess, uh, went to Lisbon and interviewed some refugees and told the kind of stories which had always been known, you know, stories that had come from priests, from from uh, letters smuggled out from the few refugees who had, been, who had somehow managed to buy their way out and so on. All this had been known, but now it became fact because four years after the event, the New York Times was beginning to print it. And I mentioned the Times because it's the world's greatest newspaper, but the rest were barely different, I should say. Uh, many times worse. Uh, there's a long record of this in the books that were mentioned. Uh, since then, uh, there has been what I described, namely some coverage of the facts, but always displacing it. It's something that the evil Indonesians do, part of their you know, evil third world nature. Uh, we wouldn't do things like that, of course, and we deplore the shaming of Indonesia, but uh, you know, what can we do? I mean, the world is a terrible place and there are all these benighted people around, so we ought to give maybe more human even more humanitarian aid than we've done. That's the usual editor editorial message. Uh, well, you know, again, uh, for cynicism, maybe you could compare the Nazi archives or something. I haven't done it, but maybe you'll find comparable things. Uh, let me end all this on a note of hope, because there is one, and an important one. Uh, how did the story ever break through? I mean, why was any aid given to, the, to Timor? Why, why are they, is anybody alive? You know, why is anybody alive there? Uh, why did the Red Cross 
was it, was it able to send in enough aid to save maybe 100,000 people at the time of the height of the famine? Well, the reason is it's very simple. Uh, there, and it's, it's clear and obvious, and of course will never be discussed, even by the people who know it very well, like Henry Kong of the New York Times. The reason was that there was a tiny group of young people, maybe six, you know, mostly in their early 20s, uh, some of them around Cornell, where they were given the support of, of Ben Anderson, the guy I mentioned, uh, who simply devoted their lives totally to trying to get this story out. Uh, and they just did an incredible job. I mean, they, uh, uh, they, they reached the uh, press, Congress, uh, uh, and others. And finally, after years, you know, they succeeded in breaking through. Uh, virtually no support from elsewhere, but they did succeed in breaking through. They got it into the sort of diffuse kind of peace movement, and uh, people heard about it, and pressure began, and a couple of congressmen found out. And what happened is quite interesting. As soon as anybody found out about it, they were appalled, and they wanted to do something about it. The, the fact of the matter is that uh, while institutions act in a sort of Nazi-like fashion, individuals generally do not. Individuals, by and large, aren't gangsters. And when they find out what's going on, they're appalled and they want to stop it. So when a couple of people in Congress, for example, or in the few in the press, discovered finally what it was, they, were, they actually did something to try to stop it. Well, they couldn't do much, but they at least were able to do things like uh, uh, getting uh, some aid in. Uh, and there, there's an obvious message there. Uh, in fact, it's a message which, is, which the peace movement, as, you know, whatever that is, has been very slow to learn. In fact, I remember many, all of you who've been active in it know for years there have been debates over whether the peace movement should appeal to sort of the baser instincts of the unwashed masses and try to uh, get them, uh, you know, what's the word, uh, uh, radicalized or something, by getting them to see that their own interests are going to be harmed by these terrible things. That's the only way you can appeal to, you know, the sort of brutish masses. We, of course, understand that there are moral reasons for being opposed to aggression and massacre, but other people, the ones we're trying to organize, they're only going to understand if, you know, you can show them that they're, you know, that they're, they're going to they're gonna have less wages or something like that. So therefore, we've got to tie make these connections. Well, that's all sort of right. You should make the connection. But uh, the fact is that the people who run the show have a very different picture. They're very much afraid that the unwashed masses are going to act out of moral conviction. Uh, and therefore, they have designed this magnificent propaganda system in which the universities play a major role, and the press too, which makes sure that the population doesn't hear these things uh, out of fear that if they do hear them, since they aren't gangsters, they're going to do something to stop them. Uh, and my feeling is that the people who run the show are right, that they have a kind of understanding and insight, which many people on the peace movement have lacked. Uh, and I think we should take that message from them and look at the cases of which this is an interesting one, uh, where and a, you know a, a, an effort that was very small in scale, though enormous in courage and intensity, did succeed in breaking through a a uh, very impressive campaign of silence and distortion and deceit on the part of the State Department and the conformist press. And it had an effect, had a big effect. Uh, and if it continues, it could have an even bigger effect. And I, I, you know, it's hard to predict the future, but I think that there still are possibilities that, uh, 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 that the UN resolutions, which do consistently call for uh, uh, self-determination for the people of East Timor, it's just conceivable that they may may succeed. I mean, there, there are conflicts inside Indonesia uh, that, that may be relevant. Uh, and if the United States and its allies stop uh, carrying out the acts that Moynihan described, making the UN utterly ineffective in whatever measures it undertook, uh, it is still possible that uh, self-determination for the remnants of the population will be achieved uh, and that uh, there will be some some survival from this uh, act of genocide. Okay, why don't we talk for a while until the film gets uh, set up, yeah. Comment on these rather scurrilous attacks on your book? Uh, yeah, if you want. Uh, so I, this was handed out last night. Uh, whenever I give a talk on the Middle East, there is an unsigned document. Uh, well, here I notice it has a name, but I don't know if anybody knows who they are. 
which consists of, as you say, scurrilous attacks on my book. So let me mention them. Uh, I, I don't know if you have the document. Uh, anyway, those who were there last night picked it up. Uh, factual mistakes in towards the new Cold War. First one said, is first one is a quote from Michael Mandelbaum in the New York Times Book Review, which says that uh, uh, he. he I'm quoting from him. He says, he writes, I write, that Israel is alleged to have supplied 98% of Somoza's arms through the end of his, towards the end of his bloody rule in Nicaragua. Reviewer says, the statement is a curious one, if only because while towards a new Cold War has on the order of 900 notes at the back of the book covering more than 100 pages of small print, this particular assertion carries no citation. So that makes it curious, and you know, something must be going on there. Uh, you know, in other words, when you talk about a holy state, you're not allowed to make any comment without a footnote. You know, like every phrase has to have a footnote after. Of course, like if you talk about the Soviet Union or something, that's not necessary. Well, in fact, there was a footnote there, exactly where it belonged, uh, after a series of statements uh, quoting the source cited. And if you check the source, it ultimately turns out to be CIPRI, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. Uh, and the footnote was there, exactly where it was cited. And the people who wrote this, progressive students, know that for certain because the Times published a letter of mine shortly after in which the fact was pointed out, but it wasn't deemed proper to say it. However, suppose the footnote wasn't there. You know, suppose somebody dared to make a statement about a holy state without giving a footnote. Uh, is, you know, is that a, a factual mis Okay, yeah, tells you something. Then comes a comment from Walter LeCur, uh, a man who in fact is a former Israeli journalist, though he never describes himself that way, uh, in, in a very interesting article, which I really urge you to read. It's a New Republic uh, so-called review of this book. The review itself actually contains one statement uh, only in about four pages, which bears on the content of the book. He cites a quote of mine, or a quote which he claims of mine, uh, in which I say something about the why, how the, I quote somebody as saying that the, uh, uh, the European population uh, in Israel is opposing uh, binationalism because of the fear of Arabs and so on, Levantinization and so on. Well, the quote doesn't exist. It was completely fabricated, though some of the phrases from the quote do exist. Uh, and uh, 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 the, however, the, the phrases from which the quote is drawn are from a section that has nothing to do with the claim that he makes. That was the one point at which he tried to come close to the review. The rest of it is rather well illustrated by things like this, uh, which are quoted here, squalid tract, clumsy piece of propaganda, ludicrous fabrication, intellectually worthless and morally grotesque, a parody of scholarship that reminds me of the worst excesses of Hitlerism and Stalinism. Uh, that, that's, that's nice. I like that. Um, that's put here as, uh, I mean, you know, when you can really drive fanatic ideologues into that kind of a frenzy and foaming at the mouth, you must be doing something. Uh, well, the, uh, that's described here as proof of factual mistakes. That's one of the entries. Okay. Uh, Lecur does mention what he calls factual mistakes, and if you look at them, there's, they're listed here, in fact. Uh, he says, uh, he, they are the following. Uh, for example, he says, I confuse a real general with a noted Russian novelist. That's a pretty bad mistake, confusing a general with a Russian novelist. Uh, what is the mistake? Well, see, he, he knows, he's an Israeli, he knows Hebrew. Uh, the mistake is the following. Hebrew is written without vowels. The, the, the writing, the orthography is without vowels, and I was quoting a Hebrew, a journal in Hebrew. Well, the journal in Hebrew has the guy's name spelt, which would be in English, L-S-K-O-V. Okay, now that could be one of two names. It could either be Laskov or Leskov, L-A-S-K-O-V or L-E-S-K-O-V. I wrote it L-E-S-K-O-V, but he says it should be L-A-S-K-O-V. Well, there was a Russian novelist, Leskov, you know, L-E-S, and the way in which he puts this great error, you know, namely picking an E instead of an A in, an or, uh, in a transcription from an orthography which has no vowels, is to say that I confused a noted Russian novelist with a, with a uh, real general. Uh, then, uh, and uh, I mean, I go through the other cases if you want. Actually, these are also discussed in a in a letter that the New York, uh, that the New Republic followed, but every one of them is exactly on that level. Uh, they, they have to do with the transcription of names. You know, these are the errors. Okay, big error. Then comes, uh, then he says the following, which is interesting. He says that I tried to whitewash the mass murders in Cambodia, and I collaborated with notorious French anti-Semites and neo-fascists in the denial of the Holocaust. Well, the statement about whitewashing the mass murders in Cambodia is just a flat, outright lie. He doesn't even try to justify it. I can talk about it if you like, but that's just a, a convenient lie, and since it's convenient, it continues to be repeated. In fact, what I wrote about the mass murders in Cambodia was that they were mass murders, uh, very explicit, but that the Western press 
uh, which really desperately needed some murders in Indochina and wasn't finding them in Vietnam where they wanted it, uh, exploited this in the most disgraceful fashion, lying fantastically about it, you know, and creating all sorts of, I mean, it was bad, the reality was bad enough, but the fabrications that were constructed by the Western press are one of the most interesting examples of coordinated uh, and effective propaganda that I've ever seen, you know, including the Nazis. If you want documentation, look at after the cataclysm. That's what he calls whitewashing the mass murders in Cambodia. In short, if you take the position that the press is not free to lie at will about crimes of an, of an, of an official enemy, then you're whitewashing those crimes. That's the logic of it. Uh, what about collaborating with the notorious French anti-Semites and neo-fascists in the denial of the Holocaust? That's a very interesting story and one which has been exploited as I expected, incidentally, most beautifully by the neo-fascists here uh, and uh, the real ones. And here's the story. It's a very interesting one and worth thinking about. There is a French professor, uh, was, at the University of Lyon uh, named Forisson, a uh, French professor of French literature who uh, sort of, you know, wrote on uh, Rambo and stuff like that. Nobody paid much attention to him. But he then started publishing uh, tracts in which he analyzed, uh, you know, the di dialogue, the diaries of Nazis and so on, and he concluded, he convinced himself that there weren't any gas chambers and, in fact, that there wasn't any Holocaust. Well, these, you know, things reached about the kind of audience you'd expect them to reach, approximately the sort of audience that the equivalent stuff here reaches. There's, for example, a professor at Northwestern of engineering named Arthur Butts, who's written many books about this kind of thing, and, uh, well, I don't know, maybe some of you have seen it. I doubt if any, I'd be, I'd be willing to guess nobody's ever seen one. I mean, that's approximately the effect of, uh, he was regarded as you know, crazy and nobody paid any attention. However, uh, he was then driven out of his teaching position by violence in the classroom, uh, and the university refused to protect him from violence. Uh, he was suspended by the president of the university from teaching, which means the state suspended him from teaching French literature. Uh, he was then brought to court uh, for, for falsification of history, for the charge, on the charge of falsification of history. Uh, he was condemned by the courts, by the French courts, for falsification of history, and the sentence reads that he was, uh, he was guilty of uh, failure of responsibility and prudence as a historian, of failure to cite all relevant documents, and of allowing others to use his writings to incite racial hatred. They never accused him of it, but they said he allowed others to use his writings, how you stop them is not clear, to incite racial hatred. Well, you know, those are interesting charges. On those charges, we could have the whole American Historical Society in jail. You know, <laughs> failure of responsibility and prudence as a historian, failure to cite all relevant documents, and so on. In fact, this is all very familiar. This is the Zhdanov doctrine. This is the Stalinist doctrine that the state has the right to determine official truth and to punish people who depart from official truth. That's what it is. There wasn't a whisper of protest about this in France. Uh, there, uh, barely. I mean, uh, I did sign a petition which said that his civil rights should be respected. The, civil, the petition went to the tribunal that was trying him for falsification of history. That petition aroused a storm of protest in, Fran in France, uh, and it was typically... Uh, the typical response was that by signing the petition in, in support of his civil rights, I was defending his theses. Well, I, wrote a, I was asked by the guy who circulated the petition to write a statement about civil liberties, apparently a very unknown notion in France. And I assumed at the time, uh, wrongly as it turned out, that in the West, in, in, well, in, in the Anglo-American countries, say England and the United States, this would be regarded as incredible scandal. You know, I was wrong about that. Uh, and I, I wrote just something about civil liberties. I said, I'm not going to talk about his, his writings. I don't care about his writings. I don't even want to look at them. But I just want to talk about the fact that people should be free to say what they want. And if we don't like the ideas, there are better ways to uh, deal with it than by violence or by appealing to the state to silence them. Uh, well, uh, that state, I told the guy who uh, asked me to, about it to do anything he wanted with it. And what he did, uh, not contrary to what I had told him, though I didn't know about it, was to add it as an opinion to a book in which Faurisson defended himself against the charges for which he was being brought to court. Okay? He was being brought to court, and he had a book in which he defended himself against the charges, and this civil libertarian <coughs> statement was added as an opinion. Okay, that's what uh, Lacour and many others have called uh, collaborating with notorious French anti-Semites and neo-fascists in the denial of the Holocaust. Okay? It's very interesting. What it means is that you know, it reflects the extent, really, to which Hitler won the war, you know, it, it, culturally speaking. That is, the, wit the, the extent to which, you know, major segments of American liberalism, at least British or American liberalism, are willing to accept the fascist doctrine that the state has the right to determine what is true 
and to use its power to prevent people from saying that. And if somebody protests and says, no, you know, whatever the guy, crazy thing the guy said, uh, he should have the right to say it without state violence uh, or individual violence, as in this case, then that means you're defending his doctrines. Well, there are very few people who have the courage to come out and say that they believe in the neo-Stalinist and fascist doctrine that the state should suppress freedom of speech. So what they do is what Lecoeur does. They say people who object to this are defending the views expressed. Okay, by the same logic, for example, when I sign a petition in favor of some Soviet dissident, often there are vicious anti-Semites and pro-Nazis and supporters of the American war in Vietnam, all kind of crazy things. By the same logic, if you defend their rights, you're defending what they say. You know? now, of course, nobody would say that in that case. But in this case, you can say it, and what's more, you can get away with it, because you're saying something that is popular within a well-designed and effective propaganda system. Very intriguing and enlightening case. Uh, there have been a raft of articles about this in the American press, all very similar to this one. And the point is that the American intelligentsia, uh, by and large, will stoop to anything in order to undermine somebody who uh, deviates from the state religion. No matter what it is, they'll be willing to do it, and then they'll get away with it. Uh, that's, the, that's that comment. Uh, then come some, most of the rest is just hysteria. You know, I live in a fantasy world, etc. The, the facts, so I won't bother talking about it. Uh, the one other fact that I was able to detect in this is a quote by Raul Jean Isaac in uh, Congress Bi-Weekly, the World Jewish Congress, in which he, she claims that I say that in Israel there can be no recognition of basic human rights. Well, that's not true. I didn't say that. But she does quote one thing correctly. She qu quotes me as saying that if a state is Jewish in certain respects, then in those respects it is not democratic. And this she and many others have regarded as scandalous, although it's elementary logic. You know? If a state is white in some respects, then in those respects it is not democratic if it has non-white citizens. If a state is Muslim in some respects and has non-Muslim citizens, then in those respects it is not democratic. It's trivial, obvious, and the same is true if you substitute Jewish for white or you know, uh, Muslim or anything else. I mean, anybody who even has their head screwed on would recognize that as a truism, but in this case, it's regarded as an absolute scandal. Okay. Uh, then, uh, she, she also makes the, another interesting comment, which reveals the extent, unfortunately, to which American Zionism is intent on reliving the history of Stalinism. She says that, uh, she makes a big fuss about the fact that although I criticize Israel, I don't criticize the Muslim states, okay, so I don't say anything about them. Uh, there's, that's, anybody who's old enough to remember will recall a sort of a sad joke back in the 1930s, and that was that if you criticized, you know, if you said there are slave labor camps in the Soviet Union, uh, the answer was from the Stalinist elite, uh, what about the lynchings in the South? Okay, that was supposed to say there aren't any slave labor camps or something. But well, this is the same thing, you know, if you criticize something in Israel, it's no, not fair because you didn't give half time to criticizing the Arab states, okay? That's standard also in American ideology. For example, if you write a book critical of American foreign policy, as I do, then uh, you know, the, the articles in, say, the Atlantic Monthly and so on will say, ah, double standard. It wasn't half devoted to the crimes of the Soviet Union. On the other hand, if you say, like, if Solzhenitsyn writes about Gulag, you don't have, to, you don't have a review saying, no fair, you know, half of it wasn't devoted to the war in Vietnam. I mean, that's <laughs> legitimate. You know? uh, and in fact, uh, but it's only, again, when you, when you when you deal with the holy state, which is the state to which most of the intelligentsia are committed, usually their own, although sometimes a foreign state, as in the case of Stalinism in Russia or contemporary American Zionism in Israel, in those cases, uh, you, you know, you have to, you're not allowed to criticize, and one of the techniques to undermine criticism is to say you didn't criticize the other guy. Well, in fact, it's not true. You know, the comments I have in the book about the PLO and Arab states are much more critical than about Israel. I didn't, I didn't have to mention it at all. It would have been irrelevant, but I did. Uh, but uh, the point is, and, and they're much more credit critical. For example, I describe in that book that she's describing the PLO program as uh, intolerable to civilized opinion. I don't make any comment about Israel. It comes close to that. You know, not even close. But it doesn't matter. The point is, there is criticism of Israel. Therefore, you know, unless you really uh, you write a book which is devoted to criticism of the Palestinians and the Arab states, well, that's not fair. Well, why should you know? Uh, there's some obvious reasons, you know, first of all, you can write a book about anything you like, you know, you want to write a book about Russia, fine, you want to write a book about America, fine, but uh, why, there's special reasons why one should devote a book to Israel, special reasons, two special reasons. One of them is that we are directly responsible for what Israel does. I mean, if there's persecution in Syria, as there is, we're not responsible for it directly. We, we didn't do it, you know, we're not supporting it, we're not funding it, we can't stop it. In the case of Israel, that's not true. We are funding it, you know, we, we can stop it. And for that reason alone, it's important. The second reason 
is that there is no clack of uh, apologists in the United States who writes about how Syria is, an, is a great democratic state, you know, the sort of uh, leading light of all the human race and so on and so forth, and denies that atrocities are going on there. There is no such clack. In the case of Israel, there is such a clack, and furthermore, they dominate the media. Again, a substantial reason for dealing with this. Uh, all of this is, doesn't take much thought to figure this out, I would think, but uh, it, it is interesting that the progressive students for peace in the Middle East think that this is perfectly reasonable criticism. That's an interesting comment on them, I think. That's runs through this. Yeah. Would you care to comment on Australia's role at the time of the Indonesian invasion of 1975 and now? Well, Australia's role is generally disgraceful particularly, uh, maybe not as bad as the American role because they haven't been, you know, really providing the arms. But to understand the Australia, are you Australian? Yeah. Well, so you'll, there's nothing you know which the rest of the audience won't. Uh, and that is that uh, to understand the Australian role, you've got to understand the background. There was a comment made there about how, uh, uh, how Australia had aided the Timorese at the time of the Japanese invasion by the Australian journalist. That's not quite accurate. It was the other way around. What happened was that uh, at the time of the Japanese invasion, there were Australian commandos uh, who I think were already there or, any, or may perhaps land them. Anyway, there were Australian commandos in Timor, and the Timorese fought to defend them. And in the course of that war, uh, tens of thousands of Timorese were killed by the Japanese as part of their effort to defend Australia which they, and the Australian commandos there, uh, of which they had no connection at all. Well, you know, that's, again, uh, not the kind of thing you want to talk about, especially when Australia was selling out the Timorese now. Well, of course, this was brought up in Australia. Uh, the, the, at the time of the invasion, uh, the, the, Labor Party, the Australian Labor Party was in power, Gough Whitlam, who uh, has always been a major apologist for Indonesia and still is so. In fact, he was just taken recently on a guided tour through East Timor. They don't allow many people in, but they allowed him in both by the Indonesians through East Timor. I think he was there for about two days. And he came out back and made the kind of speech, which again is very familiar. I mean, you know, we remember it from the Stalinists in the 30s when somebody was taken and saw smiling peasants and happy people and so on and so forth. And Gough Whitlam came back and read the script uh, of the familiar sort for the last half century, uh, saying that after his two-day visit, he could see that everything was lovely and they all loved the Indonesians and so on and so forth. Uh, well, he was prime minister at that time. Uh, the, uh, Australia played a there's a sort of a mixed role. For example, the Australian press did cover quite a lot of what happened, particularly after the Australian journalists were killed. Shackleton and four, four other Australian journalists were killed in an October attack right after this film was taken. Uh, and another Australian journalist, um, Roger East, I think his name was, was killed after the uh, Indonesian invasion on December 7th. Uh, and that, you know, raised some, uh, there was some emotion aroused about that in Australia. And the recognition of the, what the Timorese had done for Australia at the time of the war, that was also brought up. And uh, the press did, to some extent, cover it for a couple of years. In fact, there was substantial coverage in the Australian press. Uh, that's of interest to us because, of course, the American press knew what was in the Australian press. They, they can pretend that their only source of information was the State Department, but that's, that's bullshit. I mean, of course they knew what was in the Australian press. And there was plenty of material there from refugees, from... Uh, from letters smuggled through through Catholic sources, from priests and so on. The American press just didn't want to cover it. Uh, but it's, the issue, the issue is, has been battled up and back in Australia, and it still is. I mean, there's a, there's a parliamentary inquiry due in another couple of weeks uh, about East Timor. Uh, and I, I don't know. I mean, frankly, I don't know what will happen. I mean, it seems to me the, uh, this, uh, the, the sections of the Labor Party still want to push the issue, but uh, it's very inconvenient for Australia because they would like to have... Uh, friendly relations with Indonesia, and uh, the Timorese issue is in the way. So the best thing to do is sweep it under the rug. I mean, the Australian government over the years has done some pretty awful things. Like, for example, one of the there was radio contact between Fredlin and Darwin in Australia. Uh, and that was one of the few means by which Fredlin was able to contact the outside world, you know, with the Indonesian blockade and the silence of the press and so on. But the Australian government uh, cut it off, you know, a couple of years ago. And there, there are things like that. It's been a pretty ugly story, especially when you know the, the record. Nothing for Australia to be very proud of. 
Well, sort of like Everest, it's there, you know. I mean, it's uh, Indonesia wants to has has tried to gain control of the whole archipelago. In fact, you know, uh, uh, they they, uh, they they conquered, well, they took. I mean, you know, West Irian, and also in a very bloody uh, attack. And there's some thought that they maybe had their eyes on Papua New Guinea too. Uh, not impossible. Uh, as far as Timor itself is concerned, there are some you know, some things there. I mean, it's a very rich coffee-producing area. A lot of the gourmet coffee, if you like gourmet coffee, you're probably drinking Timorese coffee sold to you by Indonesian generals now who've taken over the coffee trade. Uh, but, uh, and there's probably oil offshore, you know, there are people. And furthermore, there, there are some geopolitical stories. I mean, there is the, the deepest straits, the, the, the deep water straits that, that uh, connect the Pacific and the Indian Ocean pass right off the shore there. And in fact, that's about the only passage possible for nuclear submar any kind of submarines without surfacing. The Straits of Malacca, you know, sort of the famous straits, uh, are very shallow and you've got to surface and there's 10 million tankers there and, you know, it's a big... But, but for sort of, you know, for strategic reasons, control over the strait, the Ambayawatar Straits right near, uh, off the shore of Timor, well, that's important. However, I don't really think these are the reasons for the conquest, you know. I mean, those facts are all true, but uh, the reason I suspect is primarily that uh, Indonesia was very much concerned that Fretland, the usual fear, that Fretland might succeed. I mean, this is one of the poorest areas in the whole Indonesian archipelago. And here was a, uh, a movement that developed based on mountain tribesmen. Uh, they didn't know this at the time the movie was made, but there were American anthropologists, a couple of American anthropologists up there in the mountains who have since testified before Congress, Betsy Traub and uh, Shepard Foreman, uh, who were in mountain villages at the time of Fretland organizing in 74, 75. And what they talk about is pretty astonishing. There's congressional testimony about it. They talk about the, the way in which the community was politicized, you know, the way in which Fretland sort of got mountain tribesmen who, you know, weren't even in the 20th century or the 15th century in our terms to become engaged in the process of national reconstruction and development and prepare for elections. And the, the kind of enthusiasm you saw in the movie was not just propaganda that was going on all over the island, and the Indonesians were scared to death of this. I mean, if that could happen in one of the poorest regions of the archipelago, and if it could really succeed, uh, it would be imitated elsewhere, the usual fear. And this whole extraordinarily corrupt and vicious structure might collapse, you know, from below. After all, Indonesia is not a stable society, you know. I mean, there's, uh, you know, there's continual unrest and protest and so on and so forth. And something like this happening in the in an extremely poor marginal area, that could have the demonstration effect. Same, basically the same reason why the United States had to destroy South Vietnam. Can't permit that to happen. Why does the uh, U.S. press so long with this misleading? Why? Because it's in their interest to do so. I mean, the same reason why why in the, why scholarship goes along with it. It's in your, it's in the interest of uh, it's 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 in your interest to conform to power. You know, if you don't. Uh, you, um, in a country like this, you don't get killed, but uh, you're marginalized, or you, you know, if you're young, you're removed, or you're abused, or something or other. On the other hand, if you play the game by the rules, uh, you know, there's a lot of rewards. Uh, you become, I mean, just ask, your, are you a graduate student or something? Just ask yourself, you know, what's the choice between, if, what, if you play the game by the rules, uh, in your own, I don't know what you are, but let's say a graduate student, okay. If you play the game by the rules, you'll you know, you're smart and so on and so forth. You'll, you'll get a PhD and you'll get a job and you get a professorship and it's a nice life, you know. Don't have to work very hard. I mean, you have some, uh, you, you have some access to privilege. You know, you're in the top several percent of the income structure. You become part of the, the social and economic elites. I mean, if your bent is in that direction, you can be part of the power system itself, the spokesman for them and so on. On the other hand, if you don't play the game by the rules, you probably end up driving a taxi cab, okay? Uh, or you'll be, you know, you'll be like these guys who were working on the Timor thing, who I mentioned. I mean, they work very hard and so on, but they're out of the, you know, they're out of the system of power and privilege because they're not playing a game by the rules. They're exposing it. Within the press, it's not all that different, and you have to add the fact that the press, after all, is a system of major corporations itself. I mean, the media are some of the major corporations in the country in terms of employment. They're way high up, uh, and assets and so on. Uh, and the people who run the press are parts of the, you know, they're parts of the ruling class, you know. You don't own a newspaper unless you have a lot, you know, many millions of dollars in, at your command. And not only your, 
your, your, your class commitments, your social relations, your, your policy orientation, everything is part of the same structure. Uh, and if reporters and editors and so on don't go along with that, they're not going to be there very long. You know? uh, uh, and for, uh, furthermore, uh, quite apart from that, as if that weren't enough, there's the pressure of advertising. I mean, if the press ever begins to stray, even so marginally, you know, from the sort of standard position, it will disappear. I mean, this happened. You know, even a journal like the New York Times, you know, a rich journal and, you know, powerful. A couple of years ago, there was, here's an incident that happened a couple of years ago. A few years ago, there was, uh, New York Times stock started dropping on the stock exchange. Uh, and there was an article in the Wall Street Journal about it, uh, and then in Business Week. And the article said that the Times has been taken over by a sort of a left-wing current. That kind of boggles the mind, you know. And uh, unless the time, the time and, the, and they're now suffering the day, you know, they say, now see what's happening. I mean, the stock's falling. And it said, unless the Times begins to recognize that its interests are with business, it won't be in business very much longer. Well, what was this kind of left-wing deviation on the part of the Times? You know, you take out your, you know, your electron microscope and you start going through the editorials, and you can find it. It was there. Uh, there was a mild reform proposed in the city administration that was going to raise taxes on business, and the New York Times was editorial in favor of it. Okay, and uh, because of that, you know, because of this break from the uh, sort of the loyalty, the Times started collapsing. A warning was given, small warning, saying, look, you know, get back in line. And in fact, the Times editorial staff was shifted around. I think that was the time when Max Frankel came in, in fact, and John Oakes was thrown out, if I remember. Uh, and, you know, Times went back to line. And, you know, it's in their interest to behave that way. I mean, you know, the newspapers are sort of, most of us aren't in the press, so we don't understand it. But it's every, you're all in a university. The same thing happens in the university all the time. Exactly the same thing happens all the time in the university. I mean, you know, the whole school system from kindergarten up through the university is an attempt to socialize you into this pattern. And in fact, you know, in a sort of an elite university like this one sort of is, or like, say, Harvard or so on really is, uh, you only get into those, you, by and large, you know, there's a self-selection by the time you're even in those systems. I mean, you know, people like, like me and like most of you, we get into those things because we've been passive and obedient. We've done all the crazy things people told us to do and so on. You know, we got A's and that kind of business. I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're sort of, uh, you know, you're more or less passive and obedient and you accept the external rules and so on, then you make it into these systems. People who don't are, one or another way, they don't get through, you know. And it can happen at, I mean, there are, you know, it's not a totalitarian state, so there are exceptions and, you know, they don't throw you in the prison if you say the wrong thing, but the net effect is to impose a system of, uh, quite a remarkable degree of conformism. And you can see it. I mean, this Timor thing is a remarkable example of this. I mean, some of the press reporting is absolutely incredible. For example, look, at the time of this movie, in the fall of, 19, uh, of 1975, there was substantial and accurate reporting in the Australian press about what was going on. There were a couple of Australian journalists there. Uh, Jill Jolliffe, who's written a good book about this, and uh, I think Michael Richardson, who's an older and well-established Australian correspondent, was there, and others, and they were reporting what was going on. And there were, there were visitors, you know, the parliamentary delegations visited, the International Red Cross was there, and so on, and they described the, you know, they described the very constructive, surprisingly constructive developments on the part of this, of Fredolin in this really backward area. Uh, well, the first Australian journalist to get through was a guy named Gerald Stone, who I think was a television journalist, and he got in around September, right after the Civil War. The Civil War was in August. Uh, there were all kind of lurid reports about the Civil War, about how Fredlin was massacring people and, you know, communist maniacs running around torturing people and so on. Uh, and Shackleton, uh, uh, Stone was the first reporter to get in. Uh, and he wrote uh, a long report, which appeared in the London, London Times or the London Sunday Times, one or the other, I forget, uh, in which he said that, you know, he wrote the results of his report, he said that uh, while there had been some brutality during the war and so on, he said the reports of, terror, of Fredlin terrorism were, were not only exaggerated, but he said were fabricated, and he said that he had to conclude that they were fabricated by the intelligence services of Portugal, uh, Indonesia, and he may actually mention Australia, I forget. I think maybe he said, Port I have the stuff in my book if you like, but I think he said they were fabricated by the intelligence services of Portugal, Indonesia, and Australia. They weren't true. Okay, that story appeared in the mainstream British press, New York appeared later in the New York Times, a couple of days later, slightly edited. What, this conclusion that I just quoted was deleted. Okay? And in fact, the story was edited to make it, they left in 
the few remarks he made about brutality that he had found examples of. And in fact, those were headlined. You know, the subheadings all are like Fredlin brutality, you know, this and that. Uh, and those examples are given. What his conclusion is eliminated, all the evidence for the conclusion is eliminated. The import of the story is that the charges of Fredlin brutality were true. And in fact, that was picked up then by Newsweek, which ran a story saying, you know, Marxist revolutionaries have taken over East Timor and massacring the population. See Gerald Stone in the New York Times, you know, Australian journalist goes and sees it. Okay, that's interesting. You know, that's the way it works. I mean, you do a little bit of editing, you know, cut a few things here and so on and so forth, and a report can be turned into its opposite. Well, you know, this has been exposed uh, a long time ago, and the only effect of this is for the press to hate with a passionate hatred the people who have exposed it. I mean, that's why you get, you know, reviews of the kind that you were, I was reading from before. It's because you expose these things. If you're going to, I'll warn the rest of you, you know, try to expose what the, what scholarship and the media are up to, you get the same kind of reaction. Uh, and this goes on, you know, right to the present. I mean, like, well, uh, here, 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 I'll give you an example. Every year there's, at the United Nations, there's a, uh, uh, there's a, there's a, a resolution comes through which supports uh, self-determination for East Timor. It never gets discussed in the paper, almost never even gets mentioned in the American press because the, the United States veto, you know, it's a general assembly, so the United States votes against it. Well, uh, one year, I think it was 1980, uh, there was a press, con I was testifying at the United Nations General Assembly, which I've done a couple of times on this, and there was a press conference, uh, and uh, Bernard Nossiter, who was then the U New York Times U um, correspondent for the United Nations, was asked, as was most of the press, to attend the press conference. And Nossiter, uh, Nossiter said that uh, he wouldn't attend because he said the issue was, quote, rather esoteric, I think that was the phrase he used. That was Nossiter's phrase. He said he thought the issue was rather esoteric, so he wouldn't defend it. I mean, after all, it's only a matter of maybe 200,000 people being killed by, and, you know, a famine worse than the Afra imposed by the United States, so obviously, you know, don't want to deal with that. Well, it's very interesting to look through what Nossiter did report at that time, which he didn't regard as too esoteric. Take a look at his columns from the United Nations at that period, uh, and they're interesting. They show, you know, you really show how esoteric you have to be to sort of, you know, pass the standards of the times. For example, he has a full page column, you know, top of the page down to the bottom, uh, dealing with the cosmic fact that the government of Fiji was not paid yet for its uh, UN contingent in southern Lebanon. That had a column, you know, I wasn't too esoteric. And he had another column in which, uh, which was about a debate at the United Nations over uh, a missing comma. Uh, there was apparently a big debate over whether a comma was missing in some text, and uh, nobody could figure out, you know, what, what, what it mattered or something. But anyway, this was a debate, and he has a kind of an ironic, satiric column about this. Well, Kurt, that wasn't too esoteric. That one, incidentally, you have to understand in another context. Namely, the debate involved third world delegations, and a major part of American reporting of the United Nations now is to try to show that it's uh, you know, that it's, that it's a, is to try to, is to make fun of it, and especially to make fun of the third world component. And the reason for that is very simple. Uh, back in the 1940s and the early 1950s, the United Nations was completely under the thumb of the United States, and it, it did everything we wanted, you know. And then this was a great democratic institution, and, you know, much to be applauded and so on and so forth. Since then, uh, the world has changed, and the United Nations has fallen under what the American uh, system calls the tyranny of the majority. That's the phrase that's used. We, ordinarily, we call that democracy, but in this case, it's the tyranny of the majority. And ever since then, it's been necessary to ridicule the United Nations and to make fun of it and so on and so forth. That was the context of this. Kind of final comment here to indicate something about scholarship. I think we're in the anthropology building now, aren't we? Yeah, yeah so this will be appropriate. Uh, back in around 1950, at the time before the tyranny of the majority came along and before you had to make fun of the United Nations, uh, uh, there, there was, uh, the, uh, when it was just following American orders, like, you know, from beginning to end, the Soviet Union continually was vetoing uh, things in the Security Council. And, uh, you know, this becomes an interesting question for scholarship, and American scholar, uh, and British scholars, anthropologists in particular, like Margaret Mead and Jeffrey Gore and others, devoted much thought and investigation into the question of why the Russians were vetoing uh, 
uh, Security Council resolutions. I mean, you know, one possibility was that they were vetoing it because the United Nations, the United States ran the Security Council and everything was against them. That's a possibility. But that possibility, as far as I recall, wasn't considered. Uh, in fact, what they did was develop a, I haven't seen this stuff for 20, 30 years, so my memory's a little hazy, but look back, maybe some of you will remember. Uh, they developed a, something which we as graduate students at the time used to call diaperology. The, they developed the theory that uh, uh, the reason why the Russians were vetoing things at the United Nations was because there's a kind of a negativism in Russian culture based on the fact that they use swaddling clothes for their infants. So that's <laughs> anthropology. So the Russians have swaddling clothes, and I, I don't know if you remember that stuff. It leads to this, uh, Margaret Mead, all these big figures are writing serious articles about this. And, you know, this leads to the fact that the Russians are always saying, yet, you know, because they <laughs> this kind of swaddling clothes. This was actually, you know, done very seriously. This was considered scholarship. Well, of course, now the United States is vetoing everything at the United Nations. Uh, and it's these, you know, terrible third world countries. So we have a switch. I mean, now what we have is, you know, lambasting the tyranny of the majority and doing everything you can to, you know, to undermine the, the third world contingents of the United Nations. So, like, if they defend self-determination in East Timor, that's too esoteric to discuss. But if they have some idiotic debate, as, of course, the United Nations does about a missing comma, then that's worth an article. I mean, that's the story. Well, these are, these, we could go on and on, but that's the way the propaganda system functions. And you really ought to recognize it because you've, most of you have been part of it all your lives, you know. It's the way you're trained from the beginning. Who are some corporations that own and control Well, the New York Times is a major corporation. But behind it? Behind it? I don't know. You could, you could find out. But uh, I, my guess is the New York Times is not controlled. You could, is it? Is it? No. I don't think so. I think it's, a, it's just a major corporation in itself. There's actually work on that being done here. There's a book coming out by Ben Bagdikian, who's on the Berkeley, maybe it's out already, on the Berkeley faculty, uh, which is about uh, about these questions, you know, it looks in some detail, and I understand, and and so you can find out right here. But, you know. In his book uh, about Jonestown, Mark Lane talks about the press at the end of it, and he said that when he first investigated the John Kennedy assassination, that these sort of vilifications appeared, and he thought that it was part of general socialization. He now writes that he thinks it was part of a central plan. He says the documents released under the Freedom of Information Act from the CIA contained phrases that later appeared in the exact same context in book reviews of books. And he is predicting a suit against the individuals and groups to yeah. find out who's behind it. Do you think that's far-fetched? Well, I don't know. I don't know if it's true. I mean, it doesn't seem to me impossible. You know? uh, I don't know how much central coordination there is on these things. You know? uh, I mean, I, I really don't know. It's very hard to find out. I mean, it's extremely hard to find out to what extent there's central coordination and to what extent there's just common interest, you know, common interest, self-interest. You know. But I, I, in this case, I simply don't know. Hmm. Oh, okay, last question, sorry. Yeah. Well, I, I would just conjecture, and I'd be interested in what you think. You, you passed up the, the issue of the strategic in more as perhaps secondary. Um, and it seems to me, looking at the U.S. policy, in Micronesia, Melanesia, um, and in some of the client states in Southeast Asia, that there is more of a pattern, that there are very substantial strategic interests, yeah, you're right. um, especially since the expulsion from Indochina, um, or part of Indochina. And so I, I you know, I'd be interested to, to hear more about that. I think yeah, well, you're right about that. Uh, yeah, I understand. Look, look, you're absolutely right about Micronesia and Melanesia and so on. In fact, you know, these are huge areas which are still uh, the, the only areas that have not been decolonized. They're still under America. I mean, the United States in the, in the wartime, see, when we really ran the United Nations and it was no tyranny of the majority and that stuff, we managed to get an exception from the whole decolonization system, namely for these big areas of the Pacific that were turned into American colonies. Uh, and they are important. You're right. I mean, uh, for example, we, we want... Uh, uh, we want military bases there. We want uh, nuclear installations there. There's, in fact, a big fight going on right now in one of the islands, uh, Palau, I think. Palau, yeah. Palau, yeah. Uh, and the issue is that what happened, I think it's about, uh, well, there, there was a referendum taken. Uh, uh, if, correct me if I get the details wrong, but there was a referendum taken a year or two ago in which the Palauans voted for independence, uh, uh, voted for a constitution, which included independence. The United States didn't like it because we want to, the United States wants to have a big area, in fact, a huge area of the islands taken over for military installations. 
uh, which would be granted to the United States. So therefore, the United States, which still is the authority, uh, rejected the, the referendum and insisted on, they, start, they started a big, you know, they, they, they started a big development program and tried to buy off the leadership and so on and had another referendum. Well, again, the same thing won. And then another big propaganda campaign and more development and so on. They tried it again and still won. And that's where it stands. The United States is still rejecting it. And that stood now. No, you're, you're right. I mean, the whole area, you know, Guam and Palau and these whole regions are intended as major military bases uh, projected toward the Indian Ocean and even toward the Middle East. You know, I mean, for example, same with, with Australia. You know, like there are American military bases in Australia, which the Australians by and large didn't even know about and never even been consulted about often, uh, which are, uh, which, which, which are, are control, which control nuclear submarines and uh, are, are part of the communication system for projected nuclear attacks and which are also back bases for as far away as the Middle East. Uh, the same is true with Philippine bases and so on. Yeah, all of this is absolutely true. The thing that I was questioning and, and I think there's no question that the United States would insist on, you know, would in fact do anything pretty much to insist on control of those deep water straits, which do give it an advantage for transit, especially of nuclear submarines. However, what I'm skeptical about is whether that's a reason for invading Timor, because I don't see any reason to believe that an independent Timor would conceivably be blocked. First of all, would want to, but I suppose they wanted to block it, you know. I mean, suppose they wanted to block the passage of American nuclear submarines in the deep water straits. I mean, you know, I mean, it just doesn't seem to me that that's a realistic reason for uh, invading East Timor. But the point you make is correct. There are significant strategic interests there, and there's a lot of stuff going on that's important. Not just the United States. I mean, for example, France is doing some really vicious things there. In fact, they're just wiping out islands, you know, islands because they want them for nuclear tests. And when the socialist government in France is asked why to do this, they say, well, look, you know, we have to have nuclear tests. Well, you know, if you have to have nuclear tests, why don't have, why not have them in southern France? You know, <laughs> I mean, why have them in some island in, uh, you know, in the Pacific? Well, you know, the answer to that is clear. I mean, after all, just a bunch of little brown people or something. But uh, uh, you can't say that exactly, especially if you're a socialist. So uh, there's something else is said. And, and uh, you know, and in fact, you know, the sort of French intelligentsia, sort of fighting radicals and so on, they don't ever say anything about this stuff, if you look. <laughs>